nobody, so don't say nothing about it. You don't want nobody to hear.
about six or eight weeks ago, whatever we was down here. Danny? You leading the singing this they morning? The yeah. yeah, we'll go last. That was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Morning. Make sure everybody can hear us in here and also out in the parking lot and wherever you might be listening today. The good news today is we're back, not in full force, obviously. But it's good to see the ones of you who are able to be with us today. And for those who are out in the parking lot, the number out there, we just pray this virus will die down and we can be back to full force very, very soon, full capacity. It has been a rough week, a rough time, I should say, since we last met in here as a number of our members have tested positive for COVID. See Ray back there, he's back. Others are doing better. And we're certainly thankful for that. The bunches, uh, three of them anyhow, Chris and Lori and Michael. I think about uh, uh, Danielle and uh, her kids, one of her children, uh, they're better. But here's the most recent list, and one came out today. Eric Helton has been tested positive. Jackie and Jerry Woodring, Tammy Isaac, Anna Lawson, Michael Thornton, uh, and the boys, uh, Ashton and Bentley. Mallory says they're all improving. Bobby Hazelwood, we have other people outside of our own immediate family who are affected by this virus, so we need to remember them. Ashley Workman is another. Danny and Renee, uh, Renee's granddaughter, she's actually on a ventilator in Boise, Idaho, but uh, all of her vitals are good, and we just pray that she'll recover completely. And there are others on our prayer list that don't have COVID, and we need to remember them. Those that come to my mind are, are Matt Vanderplue recovering from shoulder surgery, uh, Kay Ann uh, and uh, Jerry Boswell, maybe they're out in the parking lot and pray. And Terry Sotos, I want to mention Terry. <clears throat> she has suffered a great deal in her legs. Uh, three of the doctors think it is a, uh, an effect from the, vaccine, the last vaccination she had. They don't know that for sure. They did a nerve study and said her nerves are firing her muscles, uh, but she has neuropathy in her left leg, no real medical condition to justify what she's been experiencing, but she's very, very weak. And uh, she's waiting for a vascular test, Joan says, and uh, also to hear from Emory Hospital for her to come there. It's been a very tough time for them just waiting to get some news um, that can help her. Chris and Nancy are out in the parking lot. I know they don't want me to say this, but they fixed a ramp for 
her to get in and out of the house, and she uh, told me herself that she's very, very thankful for that. But prayers for all of these people, and I know I've probably uh, failed to mention somebody that needs our prayers. I want to mention some other news uh, that our congregation has reached out to two congregations in regard to recent disasters. Everybody does not know this, but the Waverly Church of Christ in Waverly, Tennessee, their building was not affected, but they were in a position to help others. They had family members in need. They actually lost a teenager uh, in the flood. So they've been hit pretty hard by this, and they were glad to know that we wanted to help. Also, the Hollywood Church of Christ in Palma, Louisiana, suffered a great deal from Hurricane Ida. I talked to one of the elders there, and he says, we've got more water inside our building than outside. And we're going to have to gut the inside and redo it, as well as have some family members in need. And so our elders... Uh, wanted to do something really uh, in response to the help that we got back in 2013 when the tornado hit us. And we know how appreciative we were of the help that we received from other congregations. So as we have a uh, ability to do so, we want to help others. And we recently sent $1,000 to each of those congregations. And I know they're very appreciative. Well... Let's take a song book as uh, Eric comes and leads us in our singing and everybody in the parking lot will encourage you to sing out and let's uh, enjoy our worship today. <coughs> Number 180, 180. Come, let us all unite to see God is love. Let heaven and earth their praises bring. God is love. Let every soul from sin awake, each in his heart. Jesus' name, 
fear the spirits of the sick also. If they're not here with us, and something might be said or done, we'll make them show the error, see the error of their ways, and be back with us once again. Father, we pray for your guidance. We pray that you'll be with us. And we, we pray that you'll always be there for us to lean on. Father, we ask you to forgive us for our many sins. And be with us for the remainder of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. For the Lord's Supper, number 268, 268, I gave my life for thee. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou Himself 
without spot to God. Cleanse your conscience from, the, from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption, for the redemption uh, of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is a, a testament, there must also of necessity be the death, the death of the testator. For the testament is enforced after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet, wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled the blood of both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. I find it interesting that how really easy it is to understand if we read and understand the, that we no longer are under the Old Testament law. I would encourage anyone that may be listening to then we just read the first nine chapters of Hebrews from where we just read. We understand that we're under a, a better testament. We're under the New Testament. And when this life is over, that will be what we answer to on the day of judgment. But in preparing our minds for the Lord's Supper, as we read about the shedding of blood, we can't help but think and take our minds back to the cross before Jesus died by, by the giving of his body willfully and the shedding of his blood so that among other things that that, that, did, that we could have remission of our sins let us give thanks Father we are so thankful for this first day of the week this day that the church comes together and and assembles worship fellowship with one another Father you in fellowship with us Father we're thankful for what Jesus did at Calvary we know without you sending him for this purpose and for him willfully in his life, we would have no hope. And Father, in a special way, may we, as we partake of this, this bread, which represents his body, that he gave as it hung at Calvary, and as he died, may we do so in a pleasing fashion to you. In Jesus' name we pray.
continue our thoughts of, of Jesus, his sacrifice, his standing in our place, him taking on the wrath of sin and hanging there by himself. As the, as the earth darkened, as the, as the things that unfolded that day, and as even the as even the Romans, some of them standing there, the guards knew who he was, and Father, we're thankful that we know who he was and who he is. And Father, by him shedding his blood and giving his life, it provides us hope. It provides us a way back to you that our that sin has separated us. So Father, may we, we see this in our minds and understand it in our, and understand it in our minds as we partake of this fruit of the vine which represents that precious blood. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Invitation song will be number 613, 613, Take My Life and Let It Be. Song before the lesson, 859, 859, He Paid a Debt. Glad that Jesus did all. 
Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. One day he's coming back for me to live with him eternally. Won't it be glory to see him on that day? I then will sing a brand new song, amazing grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. If you're out in the parking lot, have considered coming in to the building but nervous about the crowd, let me assure you, you will, you will have plenty of places to sit. This whole side over here from the middle down is vacant and uh, so if you're tempted to come in and just not sure, let me assure you that uh, you, you would be safe to do so. I think that where I, I was sitting with Bonnie, I could sneeze three times, times and not touch anybody uh, except her. But uh, we are glad at least to be back, and we look forward to a time when we can all be back. You know, we live in a world of bad news, don't we? Just everywhere we turn anymore, it just seems like it's bad news. Uh, whether it be the virus, uh, natural disasters, as we've mentioned, uh, Danny in his prayer alluded to the division, political division and unrest. And it's easy to get really tired of that, isn't it? It reminds me of this story that I think we can relate to. This man who came in from work and he just had a really rough day. He sat down in his chair and he looked at his wife and he could tell, well, she looked like she's had a bad day herself. And so as she was coming over to the chair to tell him, to talk to him, he just held up his hand and said, Honey, whatever you tell me, please don't give me any bad news. Just give me some good news. And she thought about that for a second, and she said, Okay, you have three children, and two of them did not fall out of the tree and break their legs. <laughs> I guess that's one way to relate some bad news, isn't it? But you know, one reason I do like coming and being able to assemble here and to worship God is because we talk about good news. The gospel is good news. That's what it means. When we read stories about Jesus and his miracles, it's all good news, whether he's calming a raging sea or... Uh, casting demons out of a man and putting them in his right mind. No matter what it is, it's good news. And today, I want to give you another good news story. It's a familiar story where Jesus healed a woman with a terrible disease. If you have your Bible, please turn to this. It's in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 25. And uh, just so you know, it's also recorded in Matthew 9 and Luke 8. But we'll read from Mark 5, beginning at verse 25. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garments, for she said, If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. 
And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Now we know that Jesus was very busy at this time teaching and performing a lot of miracles. You'll read ahead of this story. You'll see some things that he did. In fact, he's in Capernaum and he's been met by a man, a, a ruler of the Jews by the name of Jairus who has urged him to come to his house and help his daughter who is at the point of death. And so as Jesus is going there, he's being followed and uh, really surrounded by a throng of people. And this woman uh, pushes through the crowd and reaches out her hand and touches his garment, the hem of his garment, we're told. And uh, we learn from this story, I think, a number of lessons that are worth our study today. Four lessons in particular. First lesson comes from her suffering. Look how this woman suffered. She suffered physically, obviously. She had a blood disorder, a hemorrhage, where she was constantly losing blood, which meant that she would be very weak and pale and anemic. We're told that she suffered for, for, from this for 12 years, and so it was a chronic condition. It wouldn't go away. And I know I'm talking to people uh, who have had or even have now a chronic condition, whether it be diabetes or fibromyalgia or arthritis or thyroid problems. And you can relate to this woman's problem because you have a problem that just doesn't go away. You've suffered a lot of pain. And uh, it just... Uh, and there seems to be no, no help for you. So she suffered in a great physical way. But this woman also suffered emotionally. Think about the toil, the toll that this took on her emotionally. Having a discharge of blood made her unclean. If you look at Leviticus 15, Verse 25, Leviticus 15, 25 says, If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, other than at the time of her customary impurity, or if it runs beyond her usual time of impurity, all the days of her unclean discharge shall be as the days of her customary impurity. She shall be unclean. So that was the law. And as you go on to read a couple more verses, you see that it meant every bed she laid down on would be unclean. Every couch she sat on, every chair she sat on would be unclean. Everything she touched would be unclean. And anyone who touched what she had touched would be unclean and have to go through some ceremonial cleansing and a waiting period before they could be counted clean again. This then made her an outcast. She was shut off from society. She couldn't go into the marketplace. She couldn't even enter the temple to worship. She was an outcast. Really, she shouldn't have been in this crowd because everyone she touched would be unclean. Can you imagine that? The, the isolation, the humiliation, 
that she must have felt and has had this chronic condition for 12 years. Maybe she had it as a teenager and, and thus couldn't marry because she would be undesirable for marriage. We don't know. We just know she suffered for 12 years as a social outcast and how frustrating it had to be. So there's great emotional pain. In addition to all of this, the woman suffered financially. Look at verse 26. Mark says she had spent all that she had and was no better, better but rather grew worse. Well, it's a little wonder because back then they didn't have the medical technology we have today. In fact, they had charlatans who took advantage of people. <coughs> And they had medical treatments that were often very weird. One source, the, the Talmud, a Jewish kind of a guideline for living, where the rabbis wrote their uh, opinions about things. In the Talmud, uh, there were no less than 11 different cures for this, so-called cures for this disease. Uh, like uh, tonics, some of which might have given her a little boost, we don't know. But others were crank things, like taking the ashes of an os ostrich egg, putting it in a linen cloth and carrying that on her person during the summer, and then in the winter put it in a cotton cloth or cotton bag and carry that around. Supposedly, this was to help this woman. Well, if this woman had spent all of her living on physicians, uh, it's probably because she had tried some of these uh, nonsensical kinds of cures. And I suspect that there are many listening today who can relate to that. Uh, you've gone to one doctor after another and tried to get help for whatever you've been dealing with with no, uh, without getting any better, with no hope of getting better. In fact, you may have gotten even worse, and it's got to be very frustrating. But what we notice about this woman is, in spite of her years of suffering without any help whatsoever, she didn't give up. She didn't give up. She didn't quit hoping, and she had heard of Jesus. There's no indication she had ever met him, but she had heard of him. Certainly the news about Jesus was circulating wide regarding uh, reports of healings and such things and, and other miracles. And she decided that she had to go see him. She believed that he could help her as, as evidenced by her own comment. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be clean. I'll be healed. In times of suffering, many people spend their time thinking, why me? Lord, why, why do I have this problem? What did I do to deserve this? And, and that's very human to react like that. But sometimes people, even Christians, decide God doesn't love me. God must not care about me anymore or he wouldn't let me suffer like this. But that's not true. Nor is it fair to say that about God. And so instead of blaming God and asking why me, we, we really need to bring ourselves to ask, Lord, I've got this problem. I, I haven't been helped. It is what it is. So what can I learn from this? How can I manage this and still be faithful to you? If we do that, we would learn a lot of lessons, I think. Primarily, we learn that God still loves us. You know, suffering is a part of life. It's a fact of life. There's not a one in here or out in the parking lot who doesn't have some sort of a problem or somebody in your family that has doesn't have a problem, we, we should understand that. But it doesn't diminish God's love for us or mean that he doesn't care about us. 
Like Paul, when he was afflicted with the thorn in the flesh, as Brian read to us a few minutes ago from 2 Corinthians 12, we don't know what it was, but he had this thorn in the flesh. Some think it was poor eyesight. Others think maybe because of the beatings that he took from both the Jews and the Romans. He was in a shipwreck. All the suffering, physical suffering that he experienced in spreading the gospel that maybe he suffered permanently from something like that. Well, we, we really don't know, but he begged the Lord to take it away. But you know what the Lord said? He said, no. No. My grace is sufficient for you. Meaning what? I think meaning that I will give you the grace that you need to endure this and to continue on doing the work that you're doing. And I think maybe the Lord gave that answer because he didn't want Paul to think if, if he had taken this ailment away, all the good that Paul did, and he did a great deal of good, as you know, he might have began to feel boastful about himself. And I say that because of what he then says. Paul goes on to say, and we need this attitude of Paul, in verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 12, therefore most gladly, notice the, the positive attitude he has in spite of this thorn most gladly I will rather boast in my infirmities not in myself I'll boast in my infirmities one that the power of Christ may rest in me it's a wonderful statement of faith Paul was saying I'll, I can't do anything about this affliction it is what it is, so I'll embrace it and use it to show that God loves me and that he wants me to depend upon him for strength. And Paul certainly had that strength to endure. So sometimes God takes away our suffering, and we're thankful for that. We pray he will take away the suffering of all those we've mentioned in announcements this morning. We know you're suffering. Some have gotten better. Some are not. And we just pray you'll get better. And, and sometimes God takes away our suffering. Other times he gives us the strength to bear up under our suffering. But there are two attitudes we can have. One, we can let it turn us sour and have the why me attitude and, and blame God and turn away from God. And sadly, some Christians have done that. Please don't do that. Or we can have the attitude to, that Paul had and that this woman had that says it is what it is. I'll embrace it. I'll put my trust in the Lord. And let him produce in me a greater faith so that I can have the strength to endure it. And that's what this woman did. She didn't give up on God. She didn't blame God. She didn't question God's goodness. But rather she just sought the comfort and uh, the strength and the healing that only the Lord could give her. The second lesson comes from her faith. As Jesus was making his way through this crowd, this hand reached out and touched the fringe of his robe, and suddenly he stopped and said, Who touched me? And in one of the accounts, Peter spoke up and said, In effect, Lord, that's a, that's a funny question. You're being pressed by the crowd. A lot of people are touching you. What kind of question is that? But Jesus said somebody touched me. He meant on purpose. He knew who it was. And he knew this touch was not incidental or accidental. 
And it's interesting to me because the word he used there for touch means to cling to or to lay hold on. So I don't think it was a light fingertip touch, as some have said. I think she grabbed for that hymn. Maybe yanked it. It was only for a second or so. But according to what Jesus said, the meaning of the word is to lay hold of, like someone who is desperate for help. Well, she was, wasn't she? Now, there's two things I want to say about that. Number one, if you want the salvation that Jesus gives, then don't come to him with a half-hearted, nonchalant, lackadaisical effort. And the reason I say that is based on what this woman did and something Jesus said in Luke 13, 24. He said this, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. Well, that's what this woman was doing. She was striving to get to Jesus. She wasn't going to be denied by this crowd. That word strive means to agonize. And you see, as sinners, that's the condition that we have to recognize that we're in. We're lost without Jesus. We're like a man drowning. We're drowning in sin. And so we've got to grab hold of him. We've got to strive to reach him in order to be saved. It's not something we can be casual about. We have to strive and really even as Christians, we've got to strive every day to do the Lord's will. As Moses told the Israelites in Deuteronomy 4, verse 29, he said, You will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and all your soul. Well, that's what Jesus was saying. That's what I'm saying. We've got to strive to enter in. We've got to do as this woman did and, and reach out and, and grab what God has to offer us. Embrace it. And don't let any, anybody deny us what he has to give us. Another thing this woman knew is, and this is a rather obvious point, but she knew in that crowd that was thronging Jesus, it had to be his robe didn't it? Yeah. It couldn't be any robe. One robe was not as good as another. Just as one faith is not as good as another. Our faith must be in Jesus, not in man. There is no other name given among men by which we can have salvation other than Jesus. And she understood this. It had to be his robe it has to be the faith, the one faith that the Bible speaks about. It has to be the one baptism the Bible speaks about. An immersion into Christ for the remission of our sins. It has to be the church the Bible speaks about. One church is not as good as another. The Lord only established one church. It's His church. We can be a part of it, but it's still his church, isn't it? Churches that are built by men, yes, they have good people in them. We understand that. That's not the point. If it's a church that teaches for doctrines the commandments of men, it's not his church. And it cannot compare to his church. So the woman touched Jesus' garment because her faith was in him. She knew if I could just touch his garment, I know it will make me whole. What faith she had. And Jesus said, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. So she was healed by faith. And not faith only. You see, her faith wasn't just a factual faith. Well, I believe that he's Jesus. I believe in Jesus mentally. It was an actual faith. You see the difference? A factual faith, it says, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. 
But an actual faith acts upon what we believe. And that's what this woman was doing. I know if I just touch his garment, I can be healed. And we need to have the faith that says, I believe in Jesus so much, I'm going to do everything he has told me to do. Repent, confess his name, and obey the gospel by being baptized. So we see this about her faith. And the third lesson is this. Healing always costs Jesus something. Verse 30 says, And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? Isn't that interesting? You know, that's the only time in all the miracles that Jesus did that we are told healing someone took something out of him. You see, this woman not only felt the healing come into her body, Jesus felt that healing power go out of his body. I find that very fascinating. Because the word for power there is the same word at, that Paul used in Romans 1.16 when he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. You ever think about that? The same power that healed this woman of her disease is the power that has saved us from our sin. It's all the same power because it's His power, the power of God. No earthly power could help this woman, and no earthly power can take away your sins. So healing always costs Jesus something. Let me ask you this question. What did it cost Jesus to heal us of our sin? You know the answer, don't you? Everything. It cost him everything. That's why he died on the cross. Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb of God without blemish. It took, listen, it took some of Jesus' power to heal this woman. He felt that power go out of him, but, but it didn't kill him. But listen, it took all the power he had to heal you and me of our soul sickness. Because all of his healing power was in his life. It was in his blood. And all of that power was used up when he died on the cross. He gave his whole life, all of his power, to redeem us from our sins. Healing has always cost Jesus something. And for you and me, it cost him everything. And then the fourth and final lesson is this. Jesus demands confession. And when Jesus said, who touched me, we know he wasn't asking for information's sake. He knew who touched him. Listen, Jesus knew everybody in that crowd. He knew that woman was there. He knew everything about her. Just as he knows everyone in here, everyone uh, and what you're dealing with, he knows it all. He's God. So why do you ask the question, who touched me? I believe it was simply to make this woman reveal herself, to come out in the open and to acknowledge him for what he had done. And that's the response he got. Look at verse 33. It says, but the woman, fearing and trembling. Why was she afraid? Why was she so afraid? She was trembling because she's an unclean woman. Not only has she affected everyone she's touched, but she's touched a rabbi. Jesus, that was unlawful. How's he going to react to her? Is he going to be angry? She wasn't sure. So fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and, listen, told him the whole truth. That's what he wanted. Because in telling the whole truth, Jesus I've been sick for 12 years. I've had this blood disorder. I've spent all of my money trying to get help, but I've 
I heard about you and I just believed that you could help me. And so I disregarded what the law said and I came and I, I fell down and, and grabbed your robe and I felt the healing come into my body. What did that do? In effect, she was confessing the Lord and what he had just done for her. And that's why she came and touched him. And in this we see that Jesus wants all of us to confess our faith in him. Why? Three very quick reasons. One, we need to confess our faith to honor Jesus. Think about the fact that this woman had come in and touched the garment and was healed as she was and then slipped away unnoticed. Nobody would have, nobody would have known her. All she was was a face in the crowd. They didn't care about her. But when she told her whole story, she gave honor to Jesus. This, I've been healed and he's the reason for it. You know, the Bible says, uh, Psalm 107 verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord Say so. You've been redeemed. Then don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid to let people know. Say so. Jesus is the one who has made all the difference in your life and mine. Second, we need to confess Jesus for the sake of others because just as this woman's confession let everyone know that Jesus was the one who healed her, he can help them. And so it is when we acknowledge our faith in Jesus as the Son of God, when, we, when we're not ashamed to let people know, yeah, I'm a member of the Lord's church. Uh, come go with me. I believe Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. We're at least letting them know that there's someone who can help them as well. So we do it for the sake of others. And then thirdly, we need to confess our faith for our own sake. Again, look what it did for this woman. Again, nobody knew her. Uh, they didn't care about her. But look what happened when she made this confession. She came fearing and trembling and fell down before Jesus, not knowing how he was going to react. And he said, daughter, daughter, a term of affection, but also a term that says, you belong to me. You're one of mine. And so Jesus says to us, Matthew 10, 32, Whoever confesses me before men, him I will confess, listen, before my Father, which is in heaven. When you stand before God on the day of judgment, what would you like Jesus to say about you? How would you like him to confess you? Father, I never knew this person. They had opportunity, but they never confessed me and obeyed me. They never served me. Or, Father, this is one of mine. This is my son. This is my daughter. They belong to us. He said he's going to confess us before his Father if we will acknowledge him. So what about you? Have you confessed publicly and openly and unashamedly your faith in Jesus as the Son of God? You need to do that if you haven't. To honor him, to encourage others, and also to be blessed yourself. The Bible says... For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. But with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. It is one of the important steps we must take in order to be a Christian. If you haven't made that confession and followed it up by being baptized in Christ for remission of your sins, we urge you to do that. And if you've done that, that you've allowed sin to overtake you, you've turned away from God, maybe because of suffering in your own life, problems in your own life. Don't do that. That's the worst thing you can do. 
Come back to him and ask his forgiveness and then trust him to give you the strength to endure whatever problem you're dealing with. If you need to come, we invite you now to stand and sing. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move.